Welcome to the Nature's Image Farm podcast. We're glad you're here. I'm Greg. And I'm Susan. And together we're raising seven kids on the farm and learning life lessons along the way. So pull up a chair, rest your heels, and let's talk all things bees, homesteading, and the old time ways. Let's get after it. If you're interested in nukes, packages, queens, or supplies, visit us on the web at naturesimagefarm.com. Well, hey guys. Wow. Hey, what's up? Howdy, howdy. Welcome back to another stream team beekeeping chat. Bruce and Brian, how's it going, fellas? Going good. How about you, man? Good. Pretty good. Enjoying all this uh, ice cold weather. How about you, Bruce? No ice cold weather here. <laughs> Bruce has brood and, and sunshine and flip flops. And Brian, what do you have up in your neck of the woods? We had a wind chill today of, I think we got down to four degrees. Nice. So, yeah. Might be a little cool for flip-flops. Well, I, I, I was close to breaking out some shorts. So, yeah. you know, close. Well, I tell you, what's what's interesting is how different our weather is. Um, our beekeeping methods, approaches, context, scales, goals, dreams, desires, failures, they're all different, uh, and I think that's uh, one of the one of the neat things about what we do um, as the stream team um, individually, and also the folks that we collaborate with. Um, we can all share um, our honest uh, context, our scale, our experience, um, and that helps us all kind of uh, glean, learn, and uh, help to put a plan together uh, moving forward for the year. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about best might everything. Best might what? Best might methods, managements, treatments. Um, there's a lot to um, this conversation, um, and we're going to have a special guest tonight to uh, talk a little bit more about um, this very, very topic. Brian, looks like you've got a ver your very own I'm brand infested. new might friend, huh? I'm infested. Yeah. Well, you might go see a doctor about that. <laughs> this is like public enemy number one right here. Man, no kidding. So, yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, it's, it, it's interesting because, you know, we, it's easy for beekeepers. We can take a look at the life cycle of the honeybee, right? And for the most part, I mean, there are 42, 45 days, um, except for the winter bees. And of course, except for drones and queens but when we look at the cycle um, of the bees to try to understand their existence in a snapshot that we can kind of understand we look at our own existence on earth as a very limited picture too and also our um, experience and existence working with the bees we only have so many years of continual feedback and and information loops and things um, to use as a reference point um, as we continue uh, to do the best that we can for our bees. And then what's interesting to think about is, you know, there's an old proverb where there's nothing new under the sun. There, there, it's always been something, it seems, um, with anything on the farm, but especially bees. And um, as we move forward and try to put together a plan that actually works for us individually, I think there's a lot of information that um, the folks in the comments, the folks that are listening um, to the via the podcast on um, the uh, the replay um, on YouTube, but in years to come, can come back to a podcast or a video like this and say, okay, here's what these guys were doing. Here's what their scale is. Here's what their context is. Here's mm -hmm. what their goals are, and then here's what their might strategies were. And I think that's an important piece of information because um, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I'm I'm wrong a lot, and I'll I'll be up, up front and say that. But I don't think any of us have a might strategy that we are 100% happy with. Bruce, are you? Uh, no. No. Ryan? <laughs> I'm not. Bruce, what is it do you think um, at, as we will kind of do some introductions um, as we um, 
lay the red carpet out for uh, for Ian to come share um, his experience with us. Bruce, uh, can you uh, for new folks who are just tuning into the podcast or checking out this video replay, um, or if they're joining uh, live tonight uh, for the stream team beekeeping chat, uh, can you briefly tell us about uh, Bruce's bees, your context, um, your scale, and your goals in the bee yard, and how um, you are looking to improve your mite strategy moving forward? Well, Bruce's bees <clears throat> has been an obsession of mine now for. 10 years, almost 10 years, and it started off with just uh, asking my mother if I could have a couple of hives because I thought it'd be cool, um, and now it, it, as soon as I opened up those uh, hives the first time, it became an obsession for me, and and I love it. <clears throat> I still love it, and, and sometimes it absolutely wears me out, but I've grown up to now where I have, if you mentioned scale, I, I vary, I vacillate between 100 to 150 colonies the last couple of years i got down a little bit lower than that last year i had a lot of loss and uh which does lead to tonight's topic i think a lot of that was because of mites but my goals are to this year i'm going to try to grow significant uh significant amount and try to move forward and and uh i think <clears throat> in my case i have a hard time figuring out what i want to do when i grow up and so i'm still trying to get that figured out but um i do enjoy the the beekeeping part of it i enjoy the the business part of it i enjoy this community with the stream team and and uh just the beekeeping uh, community in general the hive life community and it's just a, a culmination of all those things that keep me going but really we've discussed before the just the the divinity that there is in a beekeep in a beehive you know in a colony of bees just the it, it has to be it's something divine to me it's it's a therapeutic it's where i feel in many ways uh, close to nature and close to god in, in many ways as well and so i just i'm obsessed with it i'm passionate about it and who knows where it's going to take us i am also almost equally as obsessed in a lot of ways with the youtube thing i'm trying to figure that out but but the bees is, is the basis for it all. Um, as you say, Greg, the bees are the conduit to the people and it all just works together in a, in a beautiful, um, fabric, I guess you could say weaving a beautiful fabric together, uh, with this whole thing we're trying to do with both with the bees, uh, the YouTube channels and the stream team beekeeping chat. That's awesome. It, I, I hope, uh, with tonight's conversation, future conversations and a, another year, um, under our belt, Bruce, that we can continue to, uh, as a collective, uh, get our bees in the, the healthiest position possible, try to get a better handle on um, how to exist with these mites and um, do the best that we can to just keep pushing our needles in a positive uh, direction. Brian, what about you? For folks who are tuning into the first time on the podcast uh, or the YouTube replay or if they're listening live tonight, uh, let folks um, know a little bit about uh, Castle Hives, your um, your your context, your scale, mm -hmm. uh, your goals, and your so far your greatest challenge with um, keeping uh, mites at bay. Well, Castle Hives started. It was April of 2017. So uh, this season coming up, 2023, will be my seventh season. Um, I started out, and you know, un unlike Bruce. Uh, I really don't want to go down the road of becoming a sideliner or even becoming a commercial beekeeper. Um, I, I more enjoy, you know, I think we've spoken prior that intimacy and, and that relationship with the colonies where if you want to go out and you want to enjoy five minutes staring at one frame, you can do so. Um, so, you know, that's more or less, I, I just want to stay in that hobby realm. Um, I, I kind of chuckled in the back of my head when Bruce is saying anywhere between a hundred to 150, if you take off a zero, that's more or less where I'll be at. So anywhere between 10 and I don't want to give anything away, but you know, 10 and hashtag Brian 15, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that, that might be what people see this year, who knows, but you have to stay tuned to find that out. Um, but you know, challenges, it's the, the topic that we're going to talk about here tonight, it's mite control, just because one of the challenges that I had in my, um, beekeeping journey that I say is, you know, I switched up treatments that I was using that 
was a little bit effective and I wanted to change it up a little bit. Um, and I went to a different treatment, didn't fully research it, didn't fully understand it. And the challenge that I was, you know, facing then was losing colonies. So, you know, that was, I, I think the greatest challenge for me, it's just kind of understanding, you know, all of those little nuances mm -hmm. in managing an apiary. Right. So that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, and I think that's, that's why conversations like tonight are important is if we can better understand, um, how these different products work, um, when that they're actually effective, and then how to actually apply those um, in the most efficient manner. Um, that's, I think, what a lot of folks um, are struggling with. Asking the question, you know, what, are, what do folks struggle with the most? There's been just a, an incredible uh, variety of different answers. A lot has to do with timing, uh, consistency, and um, knowing that what they're doing is actually um, effective. I'll quickly, before we bring uh, Mr. Ian Stepler on, um, as we paint this, uh, this portrait tonight of uh, this discussion, uh, we've, we've covered uh, wh who Bruce is, what he's doing, what he's up to with Brian. Um, for us, my wife Susan and I, we have seven kids. Uh, we raise them on the farm. Uh, beekeeping um, is our, bee, uh, our farm number one business. And uh, in doing so, we are very honest and candid that we treat bees like a business. Um, and we, it's, it's an asset that we are investing in. Um, we are, there are returns on those investments. That's just basic uh, business economics. As we've grown the business, we've, we have had no choice uh, but, but to get uh, more uh, deliberate, as Bruce would say, intentional, um, but also be uh, very uh, much more in tune with what actually is going on with these bees and what we can do to keep them healthy and producing. And that is a whole long, very long, sad sob story, I'll save for another time. Um, but the long and the short of it, we, we, we fluctuate somewhere between two and 500 colonies, depending on if we've got nukes out there, uh, queen mating nukes, production colonies. It, there's a massive ebb and flow. Our primary goal is raising nukes and queens at, at small scale. Um, you know, just for an example, this year we'll probably raise um, no more than maybe 1,500 queens at the very most. Uh, we might raise uh, for, to sell right around maybe 200 nukes. And then we'll just keep pumping produ uh, production colonies um, to keep feeding all those and to keep growing um, for next year. So in no means are we a large outfit, um, but is this is about where it this is about what it takes to, to make um, an income to, to support a family um, on the farm. Of course, we have a supply business, too, that we we provide supplies. We have different revenue streams, a part of this, too. Um, and that's what makes this work for us. So watching um, where our dollars are going. Uh, paying attention to how, many, how much that return is coming back. These are huge things. So tightening up the conversation, tightening up our strategy when it comes to mites um, is something that we just we can't overlook. And it's something that we have to put the, the most amount of time in. It seems like this is the time of planning on the farm where we are planning everything. If we mess up right now, it is very hard to course correct moving on throughout the, right, the rest of the year. So I um, know we've all heard the Ben Franklin quote, but um, if you fail to plan and plan to fail, that's exactly where we're at right now. So in furtherance of this conversation of mite strategy, mite strategy is there a best treatment? Um, it's an absolute honor to bring on our guest tonight, the one and only Mr. Ian Stepler. Ian, thanks for joining us tonight. Seven kids, eh? I'm trying to kick my five kids off the internet so I get some bandwidth here. <laughs> well, that's exactly. Well, see, I'm glad someone understands it because I it was five minutes before I get on. And our internet is so bad out here in the country. I got one of those. Um, I always forget the name of it, Brian. Those the the, the Starlink, Facebook, Starlink, the satellite thing. But apparently, yeah. I, I said this is how dumb I am. These things don't work if you've got cloud coverage. If you've got bad weather, we're in Ohio. It's always cloud coverage. Um, so now we're scrambling to kick all the kids off so I can get that whopping six megabytes <laughs> a second to get on here on the stream. But uh, yeah, seven kids. The last ones were, were buy one, get one, Ian. So we, they, they were twins. So we, we would only really be <laughs> one ahead of you. So it's, it's, not, a, oh, it's not a contest, yeah. but I, I'm, I, I'm glad you, you, you feel us there. Ian, thanks for taking some time uh, tonight to have uh, to, to kind of go down a rabbit hole 
uh, in a conversation that is very uncomfortable um, and it can, can be difficult for a lot of folks to be open with. So I appreciate you taking the time uh, to just let her rip when it comes to my strategy. Yeah, I appreciate you letting me on just to brainstorm, I guess, if anything. Uh, it was, when was the last time I was on here? It, it's been quite a while, I think. And I remember you asking me, uh, Greg, is what you said, well, what do you do for might control? And I remember saying, well, I use Apivar, and that's kind of what I use, and I use some oxalic. And then you go into your kind of might control regime, and I was thinking to myself, man, I really simplified things. Like, things are just too simple. And I was thinking, well, that's fine because it works, right? And if it does, it, it, there's no need to change things. But now I'm trying to, I'm starting to experience some difficulties with my mite treatment regime. And I'm realizing that I haven't dabbled enough with other products to be able to gain enough experience to be able to implement maybe an alternative product into my mite strategy throughout my entire operation. Like I'm, I'm really struggling right now. I, like I use Apivar in the spring, Apivar in the fall, and Oxalic, and I was working for a while. Now I'm finding the Apivar maybe isn't working like it should, and I'm resting everything on the Oxalic, and I'm going to have to start switching things up, which mm. means I'm going to have to start incorporating Formic or Thymol or other products like that into my operating scheme. And I, if I take the mite control at face value, for its efficacy, that's fine. You know, I can do that. But I'm really having trouble grasping or may, maybe I'm going to be reaching out to you here and some guidance on uh, the the casualties, I guess you can say, of using these products. Like if I'm going to be using Formic at certain times a year, what does that mean for the health of my colonies? So, yeah, that's what I'm here for is just to do a little brainstorming to dig into your uh, base of knowledge. Well, that's we, we appreciate it because we were we were talking before you got on, just kind of setting the stage per se, is that uh, we, we we all are coming from uh, different context, scales, goals, um, and even styles, and that's all really important. Um, that if that if those weren't enough factors, we've got different things like weather and maybe strains of bees and windows of opportunity, um, which is farming. Um, and so what we do yeah. in those where there are opportunities is different, and I think I. I'm hoping conversations like this shed a little bit of light on where there may be potential opportunities for not only us, but folks listening on the podcast, um, watching this video on a replay or, or, or with this live tonight on the stream team beekeeping chat. There are, there's a, there, it's easy to get complacent and comfortable with what we're doing when we and expecting a certain result, but I'll be the, and I don't think I have to say, I'll be the first one to say this, but, when you get something that's working and you're finding 80% success, you know, or maybe it dips down into the 75%, when you're raising bees, you can come back relatively quick and pain, painless. Um, but once you start getting below 80 and down to that 75 or below, as far as what your numbers are coming back out of the springtime, it was really affecting um, your capability and how much momentum you have to grow if you're in a growth phase. And I think a lot of us, um, Ian, I don't know if, if you've hit the the number where you are comfortable staying and that's where you want to go. I know me, Bruce and Brian, especially Brian, hashtag Brian 15, um, is we're, we're, we're all pushing it and we're all, we, we, we need to have these bee resources to do something with, whether it's a honey yield, whether it's bees, and we can sometimes get stuck um, and trying to figure all these things out, we can very easily get stuck in just doing what we think is working, maybe having bias to what we think is working, being apprehensive on trying other methods because we hear this or we hear that. Um, and so I'm looking forward tonight, Ian, to kind of digging into um, some of these different um, opportunities uh, for mites um, with just uh, complete um, transparency. At some point tonight, uh, we do have a a, uh, a a giveaway. I'll briefly show that. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Tim Byrne uh, Jr. down in Kentucky has hand forged a one of a kind, unique hive tool. The camera does not do this thing any kind of justice, but it has um, some 3D checkering um, on the front. Looks like a farrier rasp kind of on the back. 
it's a beautiful piece of not only art, but functional uh, bee equipment. He wanted to make sure that we get that to somebody. He's going to have some more that he's going to uh, donate for, uh, for Hive Life too. So stay tuned later on tonight as we, as we give that away and talk about um, a bunch of other things. But um, Ian, I know you've got a lot of things on your mind and you're a very, you're, you are way better articulated with uh, sharing this message. So um, I think I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you start this dialogue and open it up and see where it goes. Yeah. I don't know if I want to be any bigger than 1500 colonies. You know, seem to, I always say that the honeybees determine what size of operation you're going to run. Cause if you get a little bit too ambitious, it'll just slap you back to what you can handle. And I'm thinking I'm pretty much at that right now. I, I have to figure out one very important aspect is that, and that's controlling diseases like varroa mites. And I'm last fall, I was like my hives in the shed, don't get me wrong. They're in terrific shape. Um, like what do I have in there? I ended up like 1400 or something like that in the shed and they're in really good shape. But last fall, I think I was just seeing some warning shots from uh, efficacy problems with the, with the app of our started seeing uh, like I'm testing, I'm random testing all the time. So I'm always determining what is going on and if the treatment's working or not working. And for the most part throughout the yards, I was finding uh, counts zero to point zero five or you know half a percent or whatever and then every once in a while i'll have this high expression mite hive right out of the middle of nowhere and they were there testing over 10 percent and another one over there another one over there like 25 percent mite counts within a yard of uh controlled mite levels i was like what is going on here i wasn't sure what was going on so i went through and tested more and tested more and, and i think i'm just coming to the realization that I'm getting to the end of the usefulness of relying on a singular treatment like Epivar, <clears throat> much in the same way maybe we experienced fluvalinate coming through with, um, what was it, Apistan, uh, you know, it come to the end of its useful life and it, things become resistant. So I'm afraid that what I was seeing in those outliers is going to end up showing up in my entire apiary uh next year if i don't do something about it and that means rotation and there's some beekeepers that will like as a commercial beekeeper i seem to be focused on uh chemical treatment for a lot of reasons one of the most important reasons is because we can seem to control our conditions a lot more effectively we use acids and stuff like this. You have all these external conditions you got to account for. Otherwise it causes casualties. So that's why I kind of focus on this chemical treatment all the time. So if I want to start rotating my treatments, the train of thought is, well, bring Apistan in there or God forbid, check mite and just change it up as you go. But I don't want to do that because of the synergies with the chemicals itself, I think are going to ultimately be worse than you know, the solution that they're going to provide, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm trying to <clears throat> look at a, a rotation that involves more um, alternative uh, mite treatment. So that brings me to the conversation, which I need to dig into a little bit in regards to using some of these products. Uh, I've always dabbled into Formic like a long time and I've got slapped pretty hard. And then I hear beekeepers trying to incorporate this product into their mite regime and I hear horror stories about maybe uh, not so much a casualty at that point in time but casualty of the queen or whatever later on and it compromises their crop if not compromises the bees going into winter just because either they didn't use the product right or the product isn't right to be used you know mm -hmm. so I hear that with formic and I'm also hearing that with thymol, but I'm hearing efficacy with those two products also. Like the thymol, I've used thymol in the past too. And did it work? I'm not sure. But one thing I do know that the way I used it, it uh, made the bees very angry towards the queen. So I had more supersedure problem, problem, problems because of it. And also it, I used it in the wrong time of year and it seemed to make a small brood nest because I think I shut that queen down too early. So did mm -hmm. it work? Did it not work? I don't know, but I was experienced the casualties and then I couldn't get past that. So then I just relied on the Apivar. So last uh, conversation we had, uh, uh, Greg, 
you're mentioning that you used formic and that's what i want to dig into first off in regards to how did you use it and did you have any types of rules that you implied to yourself using that product just to avoid some of the problems involved with it and did you see any efficacy from the, using that formic product okay so so my experience with formic is um not in a very positive light um i don't want to blame the formic itself um, but like I said, we were, we've been pretty, I don't want to say happy. We've been pretty, um, we've relied on other products and, but this year, um, because of the learning yard, which is a five or six hive configuration that we have specifically for hands-on learning for folks because of trying to show what these other products can do, what the challenges, what the pros and cons were, um, Formic came into this conversation. Um, so to set the stage for this, the the bees that w received formic this year, um, and this 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 matters. This this plays into the grand scheme. Um, the these were the bees that got um, hit by the storm. All the boxes laid open. Those colonies lost um, upwards of seventy percent of their population that just got got rained out. After you put the boxes back, the queens were there. They were laying. Um, but one thing that it's really important to have the conversation, at least bring it into it is that while cold, wet rain kills bees, it 100% does not kill mites. I didn't understand what that meant until now um, as I'm replaying the year. But what we ended up with is 30% of our bee populations with 100% of the mite populations. And those colonies were going downhill in a hurry. And it took a little while to start to see that short of the numbers. Um, so when we were doing washes, um, Don dish soap washes, we were finding astronomical mite counts. And um, because of how high the counts were, you know, when we're getting into 10% mite counts or percentages, that is well beyond what I'm comfortable obviously using Osalic and obviously using Thymol for um, towards the end of summer. Um, and so we thought, well, let's go ahead and throw some formic at it. Um, so we did ahead, we went ahead and did formic in several colonies. Um, now, to be very clear, this is a less than 10 colony um, experiment, but that's not what's important. What's important is the context and how we murdered all these bees, because I think everyone can learn a little bit from that. Um, in those situations, even when we used one strip per 10 days, so two strips total, once every 10 days, um, we had complete abscons. Um, they weren't even right away. They were uh, like a month later. Nobody was home. Not nothing. Um, high, the, the the frames completely cleaned out. Um, in one colony, uh, Brian was there at the learning yard. As soon as we applied the formic, the bees hit the trees. They flew right over the barn, right over the the sawmill, and Brian watched them all leave. Um, so that's that's a challenge. Now, when we applied it, it was 83 degrees that day, um, and the next we had one day. Uh, so for, for folks that don't know, Formic has a threshold of 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Ian, I apologize. I don't know what that is in Celsius. Um, but um, one of the colonies that we were applying this is was an Apame hive. And it was in double brood boxes. Um, we put two treatments in above the brood um, with, a, with another box above it. They had plenty of room, plenty of ventilation. Um, and uh, I thought if it does get one degree over the threshold, the Apame should help cool that. Long story short, um, it didn't. Everything that we put Formic on that year uh, ran all the bees out, except for one four-way pallet. Uh, in this four-way pallet, they were mostly singles or story and a half. They had a super on, and they didn't get hit by the rain. They took two Formic pads, no problem. Um, and we got, those, we, we got them cleaned up to 0 to 0.5 mite counts. So context is key, which is why I took the time to explain that. Mm -hmm. Is probably the stress that killed those colonies, and with the formic, you're seeing exactly, that. and that and, and that yeah. little detail is going to follow us through tonight's talk, especially when we get into thymol. So then, the colonies that uh, weren't stressed, that didn't get rained out, you said they they took the two pads, no problem whatsoever. They did great. Yep, and that was that was just one four way pallet down there in the yard, off to the side experiencing all the same everything's only difference is little larger colony they were in they were in 10 frame singles 
um, that had not got hit with the rain. They still had the population. Oh, yeah. Did you see any queen issues to them? No queen issues there, but those colonies were just requeened um, probably five weeks before we applied Formic. So they had fresh queens in there. Oh, yeah. 30 degrees is pretty hot, too. Did you, did, was it half, like, did you see mite control from it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we were, yeah, I mean, we were, in, we were nearly 2% and we dropped down to 0.5 with, with the washes after the Formic and expect in the four ways we did on the other colonies I, I didn't even wash them because well there was no bees to wash yeah bruce do you have any experience with formic i've never used it because it's so hot down here i have yeah. debated about maybe right now you know our highs are in the of course i don't know what it is celsius but our highs are in the 60s and 70s right now so it'd probably be a really an ideal time to use it I really have not gotten super um, deliberate or intentional with my mite treatments really until the last year or two. So I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, but no, I do not have, I've never tried it. I have considered it though. I've, I've heard it's an effective treatment as long as you keep the bees in the box. Mm-hmm. That's what I've heard. But I've heard t- horror stories about queens and I've heard horse kind of like what Greg's described as well. But, but I agree with you and it sounds like those, it may have been related to that stress on those colonies. So if you've got a stressed out colony, whether it be from weather damage or just unhealthy, you know, I wonder if that contributes to abscons with Formic. I don't know. I've been playing around Mm -hmm. with uh, Randy Oliver's mite modeling that, you know, that, that model he's made where you can plug and play different treatments in and it, it'll show the mite expression through the year untreated. And then he'll, he'll provide you feedback on whether you put a treatment here or there and everywhere and just kind of, put different treatments in them and I, i'm still using the uh the efficacy at face value of course so i'm putting it all in there as if it's going to be like uh, using formic at 80 or 85 percent or whatever i was even using apivar down to 75 percent efficacy so i figured if i was going to do anything like like i'm stuck on a spring treatment right out of the shed and i'm thinking what i need to do well, I, I guess straight to the point is I'm too scared not to use a chemical treatment right out of the shed because it's 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 the most important time, if you ask me, of a beehive's development is right out, especially our winters, they're stuck inside for five and a half months. They are at the end of their rope for longevity and you and we get them outside finally and they have like three or four weeks to turn themselves into that fantastic spring nest. And I'm afraid if I use a product that's maybe stressful, like formic or thymol or something else that gives them undue stress, is this going to deter them or, or or provide a negative environment to get them flipped into spring? So I'm I'm stuck on keeping that apivar treatment in there because I do find it would be it is a useful tool mm-hmm. to use at that point of time. But we, like. What we need is the beekeeping industry is we need more options is what we need, right? We can't be examining these options that potentially could destroy the colony that you're trying to treat. That's counterproductive. It's just, to me, it's not acceptable. Like in the part of the, of, uh, of the farm where, it, where the grain farm and the cattle farm, we have so many different options at disposal that we can just pick and choose what we need according to the specific Right. environment or the animal or the disease type it's just you just match things up to best suit for the bees here i'm thinking about putting acid in there that could really compromise the nest like what the heck mm-hmm. so i think i'm stuck on that apivar even if i'm only going to see about 75 percent or so efficacy right off the start uh, and i know there's a lot of people in chat are going to disagree with me they're going to be like oh you know that's nonsense but that gives me a three week no that gives me 52 days of coverage um within that point of time through various mite cycles and then following up after that with maybe something like a formic i was thinking and the reason i was thinking that is later on in the spring the nest is developed typically i've taken my split already at that time the hives are all the common strength uh, i might even be adding a second box if i want to which do you think a second box would help with the formic treatment uh greg or what what did you they, find there yeah that if there was one thing that definitely seemed to help is um, the colonies that I had that were successful with formic 
they were a really busting single that I either a just added a uh, a second deep on top, just using them to make bulk bees, or they were in that limbo land where they were a strong single, not quite ready for another brood box, and I just laid a super on top. That configuration, whether it was two deeps or just a story and a half, worked out really well. I'm I'm I, I, the the challenge that you just brought up is one of the hardest things to figure out because as anyone who farms any piece of ground, whether it's plants or livestock, just like you mentioned, there are there are parts per million. You are dialing things into your specific scale and need. Um, and sometimes some of these products that we're using for our bees, it, it, they're too universal. And I think that's what's, what's getting us into um, some challenging situations. I know we're keeping the, the dialogue tonight um, on um, labeled, uh, branded products, but there are a lot of commercial beekeepers that are having great success with a lot of the um, types of acids that we're using, um, but they're using them in a more uh, self-mixed self, um, ratios that they're finding great success with. And so I, I, there, there's, some, there's a takeaway from that too, where if we're trying to use the same formic pad, whether it's one pad or two, uh, there's a lot of gray area here on temperatures when to place them, and if that is the right dosage for our bees. And that's where this gets to be a very hairy um, conversation, especially for us who are in this weird uh, part of the country where we try to get a spring and summer flow, and maybe we're too greedy, and we try to capture a fall flow too because it puts us at a, at a great disadvantage because we want to wait, see what happens, see what happens. Are we going to hit on a fall flow? If so, then it's like, okay, well, then your formic needed to have been on an April, May, as you're ramping up your, your summer flow, get, a, get things cleaned up then. If you wait too late in the year, it's too hot. And there's a lot, lot of comments here where a lot of folks are saying 80 degrees should really be the max threshold Fahrenheit for Formic. And that could be where a lot of us are getting in trouble with Formic is maybe we, we need to be somewhere in that 70 to 80 Fahrenheit range um, when we're using these things. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah maybe like that's uh, what I or go ahead, Bruce, sorry. I'd like to see what the results are with, I mean, I know you guys are up north, but with Southern beekeepers and, and the formic acid, I just, uh, it just gets so hot here. Like mm -hmm. if I was to use it right now, would probably be the best time to do it because it's, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, that springtime weather, you know, the the sixties and seventies, and we may get an 80 degree day occasionally, but, and we'll have some colder days in there too, but it's, uh, you know, we're, we're at that point obviously ahead of you guys as far as timing goes but i've never even really considered it just because i know it's so hot here and i've never thought about it much and i've had pretty good success with apivar but i haven't used it for the last you know really mm -hmm. last year was the first time i was uh, you know i've used some amitraz based products but the apivar i've used officially and i've had good success with it but you know maybe we just haven't you know i think it's still pretty effective right here in this area at least with my bees because it's something new that i've introduced you know in recent years and so mm -hmm. um I actually have better luck with the Apivar than with the other applications of a similar product. The you know the Amitraz based mm -hmm. products, it's, it just worked well. And so I don't know if I happened to get the strips that were infused properly, or if it was just the bees had not developed or the mites had not developed a uh, resistance to that yet. Mm -hmm. so. I've Ian, I've used Formic in the past, and there was a comment here that it said temperature hive strength and the ventil ventilation are three factors. The temperature aspect is one that if you are not spot on, you know, when you're, if you're thinking about using it, you can't look at today or you can't look at tomorrow. You have to look several days ahead. What are the temps going to do? If it's going to swing above 85, don't put it on. You know, it's just as simple as that. And that's the issue that I ran into two years ago is that the temperatures in the fall in Ohio have been fluctuating so much where we could have perfect temperatures where it's mid to upper 70s and you think it's good. And then we'll have one day where it spikes to 88 degrees. And two years ago, I think it was the last time that I used Formic, I lost two out of six queens i had colonies supersede and this was in september and then by the time they got themselves situated you know and that's that critical phase where 
you should have your winter bees starting, you know, your queen's going to start laying out your winter bees. I ended up come February, both those colonies were gone because they didn't have adequate population to make it through the winter. So that's why I transitioned to oxalic just, you know, I mean, you can walk out at any time and you could, you could vape them. Um, but the formic, it's just, it, it scares me, you know? And then last year when I was at Greg's, like he said, I'm standing in his yard and I hear the bees just fly right over my head. And you're talking 30 minutes after I think the pads were put in. Mm -hmm. It's literally that fast. So it, it scares me. That's a product that honest, it, it scares me to use it. It does. If it's used in the correct you know, fashion, you have decent temperatures, you have the ventilation, you know, you have a good colony. When I did use it in years past, you get a heck of a mite drop. It does work, but it's, it's a very sensitive treatment. Ian, I like that. It does work. work. Uh, I like that. It does work. Part of that uh, comment you made, Brian, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's important. That, yeah. I was thinking, uh, <clears throat> By fixing the treatment of formic maybe at the end of May into June for me, we're still transitioning from spring into summer. So we're not going to see those hot days typically at that point of time. So maybe maybe that'd be a good time to treat the formic just to mitigate the heat issues. Yeah. And it might be mm -hmm. a good time because I was saying the colonies are of even strength. So things will be a little bit more predictable as we're going through and treating everything the same. So then things are going to be more like sized and may more uniform. So then we're not over applying or under applying. Mm -hmm. And then the possibility of putting that second box on top just to provide a little bit of headspace to, to, to buffer that blast right off the start. So I'm thinking that that might be a good time to use the formic. One thing I get, I'm getting caught up on and maybe you can ask your, um, uh, everybody viewing here is the queen casualties uh, involved with formic. Like I'm re-looking at, I'm hearing, I just, I pulled 10% queen uh, casualty out of the air just because that's what I'm hearing from guys. Is that common? Is the queen death and queen supersedure like you're talking, Brian, is that regularly common even on a well uh, situated treatment where you have your temperature and your space and your hive strength. Or do you see, like, I, I remember reading a, an article from Randy Oliver and he says, no, he's not finding that within his study, his certain study. And he's even testing the product when it's super, super hot. And then I, you know, you talk to other people and you say there's queen casualties. So that part's got me scared. The brood I could do with a little bit of a brood damage, even if it takes out, you know, even a week of brood, I mean, that'll come back pretty quick and uh, they'll just bounce back from that. But it's the queen issue that's got me hung up on that also. Because for me as a commercial beekeeper, I'm looking at it. <clears throat> and let's say we do get 85% uh, mite control. That is good. And uh, so that puts me in a good spot going into, into the summer season for the honey flow. But if I'm going to see queen casualty, that means I got to follow up with some kind of uh, management strategy to fix those problems so it's going to take me at least five days to get through to do the treatment and then it's going to take me you know how long do I wait then maybe I wait a week after that and then we start going through finding all the problems to fix and how the heck am I going to start fixing those colonies do I just drop a queen in there or do I you know just remove those colonies or how do I it I'm starting to I'm having trouble putting together the pieces and being able to fix all the casualties that fall upon my lap because I use that certain treatment. So that's one thing that got that has me a little bit tied up in a knot and using that product right. is a queen casualty. I wonder if, you know, down here and even if you read on the package for the Thymar or the Apigard, it says to reduce the amount, reduce the dose if it's hot or if it's warm. I wonder if the uh, formic would be as effective if you reduce reduce the dose some and it wasn't as strong against you know on the bees i wonder if that would work um, it's got a pretty yeah, big range though of, of 50 i think as, as we're talking i don't wonder if there's some some opportunities formic i don't want to say historically is commonly used in the midwest as cleanup um after the, the the spring summer flow to clean up before the fall time but i don't wonder if there's potential opportunities to use it a little bit cooler. Um, a lot of us are also requeening 
as late in the year as possible after solstice going into the fall with fresh queens. So one, one, one train of thought is if there is any casualty, um, if you are at just before harvesting, when you still have time to get your field force brooded out and in the boxes and out in the field, being that formic is branded as an organic acid um, outside of price and outside of temperatures, it seems like it may be more suitable during those cooler temps, but you might have to, most folks might have to think about flipping their requeening strategy to a little bit later in the year. But one thing that, that is interesting with formic um, is and just cruising through um, NOD's website. Um, of course, you got to have ventilation. Um, where is it? Somewhere in here. And I was looking at these instructions earlier today. Um, there is a, a clause in here. Um, I'll have to find that later. But it, it is saying to not to be, to be mindful not to mix with other mitocides. The reason I say that, Ian, I wonder what your thoughts are on any synergistic relationships between formic acid and anything like anything, any kind of a residue from Apivar or anything else that might be in the wax. Yeah, well, there you go again. Yeah, like in the Hive Life, I think it was, uh, yeah, Bob was talking about, the, or was it Hive Life? He was, oh, geez, I've been to so many conventions now. Um, <laughs> I'm losing track of them. Yeah, I think it was Hive Life Bob was talking, and he was talking about the synergetic effect of definitely the chemical treatments together. That's why you don't want to rotate the chemical treatments because it just compounds itself, especially if you have a fungicide come in. It's just, right? But also with the organic acids too, there is some kind of a synergic um, effect upon that so that's something i'm gonna to have to talk to tom nolan about he's been after me for a little while to use his product and oh there he is right there he brings up a really solid point because a lot of us have we made have made i think some logical errors um in the fact that rather than than the horror stories with using one pad and murdering queens or running colonies out we've tried to go one pad for 10 days one pad for 10 days I didn't even realize that until today I'm combing through some of these uh, specifications. That approach, according to NOD, is only to capture the phreatic mites. It is doing nothing, supposedly. It is not the same as just putting one down um, for that 20-day, um, 14-day interval with two strips is, uh, is attacking the mites behind the cappings, whereas two strips placed 10 days apart according to nod is an attempt to go after phreatic mites that's a big problem because a lot of us i, I will be the first one to admit i made a logical error and i was a, just assuming it was a softer dose for a longer period of time doing the same work which should be beneficial though right don't you think you would you, well you would think as long as the potency is enough to where it's you're capturing capping uncapping cycles but what if it's what if it's not if that were the argument then i yeah, think if it's, as long as well, it's, it spans throughout the duration of a, a cycle and a half of brew sure. it should it should be exactly i wonder if tom would build a uh, comment then in regards to uh and maybe i'm putting him in an awkward spot here but uh taking two two strips putting it on as compared to one strip double the length of time like one strip mm -hmm. and then one strip is there a uh it, does he find an ease on the queen then in, re, in that mm -hmm. regard even through the heat temperatures mm -hmm. i'm really concerned about that queen <clears throat> and maybe i shouldn't be maybe those are queens that are on their way out anyways i had a beekeeper talking to me and said and you probably want to call those ones out of your operation anyways because there's probably some kind of maybe hinging back what you said, uh, Greg, maybe there's a stress problem there and it's killed the queen because mm -hmm. it's about, it's on its way out anyways. Mm -hmm. And the beekeeper said the best thing, and maybe look at it as an advantage where the, the formic maybe flash kills some of that early brood because when that queen dies, and then you can just drop another queen in there, not worry about, uh, you know, emergency cells screwing things up. So for folks listening back to uh, the replay here, Tom Nolan, uh, Hive Town, uh, makes a comment, under ideal conditions, you may get some penetration under the cap with one plus one method. 
but two strips will kill below the cap. I want him to comment on the queen issue. That's the one that I want him to mention. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So anyways, that's, that's kind of my thought process around the formic and I'm extremely interested in bringing it in and I missed the opportunity I should have took like two years ago and I should have taken a yard or two and started playing around with this product just to be able to teach myself how to use it and what conditions I can use it in and just the casualty that might uh, might become of using that product and have that experience at hand before now I have to do it on an operation base and tap into other people's experiences and, and stories, right? So lesson be learned on that part, but I guess it's not, you know, better learn at the present yeah. than not at all right Ian, is it is it possible and I, I you know i'm obviously not at the scale that you are but would it be possible to try some different treatments in different yards and just see which works best i know that that's a taking a risk but instead of trying to go operation wide if you just took a you know a certain percentage of colonies and went with your traditional maybe a third a third and a third and just try some different things and just see yeah. what, the, what the success rate would be yeah, and I think that leads into uh, thymol product, uh, yeah. which I have very well. I do have experience with it, but it wasn't a good one. Uh, but I didn't use it enough to build to gain enough experience to know what I was actually seeing. Um, do you guys have any experience with thymol, Bruce? Well, it, this was my first year ever trying it. I've always just been a amitraz base. I've used to just be OAV. And then I realized it wasn't working. You know, I just learned the information or the data that it doesn't work under the cappings and it's really somewhat ineffective, very ineffective when there's brood in the colony. I think it can, you know, OAV can keep the mites in check. I've heard, but they can't reduce the number, so to speak. And so, so I used to just do that. Then I, then I started adding some Apivar Amitraz type products into the mix. And then this year I had some real mite problems, some issues with, some of the traditional treatments I had done and I just summertime when you pull the honey off here is very difficult down here in the South on the bees. It's just a horrible time. And, uh, it's your, the mites are reaching their highest point right when we go into an immediate dearth when the honey flow ends about mid July here. And so for about a month and a half, it's just miserable. And that's when I lose a lot of colonies, July, late July, August, September. Um, but so this year I tried, I, I tried my traditional method using the, Apivar slash Amitraz type products. And some of the products didn't work as well as I had hoped. So I was kind of in, in desperation mode in October here. It's still quite warm. I guess it was actually September, October, late September, October. I tried the Apigard for the first time ever. And it was still warm enough. It was right on the border of being too hot, you know, or, or cold to, to do the full dose. And on the packaging for the Apigard, it says if it's above a certain temperature, I can't remember what that is. It's 77 degrees. Is that it? What is the temperature? I think it's 77 degrees to do a half a dose and to, to kind of play around with that. And so I did that. I did actually what I did was I did two half doses a week apart. And then I, and then I um, did, and the temperatures cooled down. And so I did one more dose, a full dose. And I left it on there for two weeks and then removed it and had pretty good success with that. I didn't see the, the, great big issues with them stopping laying they continue to lay pretty well didn't see a lot of issues with health of the colonies but now it is october so it's you know fall so they are starting to brood back a little bit anyway so i don't know maybe maybe they were brood, had brooded back or maybe they did a little bit more than i anticipated but i didn't see a lot of issues with, or problems with it and it was pretty effective i had a, just a couple of colonies that it wasn't super effective but by that point in time, the brood is way down here. And so I started hitting them with oxalic acid and I, I've hit them pretty hard with that. And so the, I think my numbers are pretty good right now, but I personally would not try Apigard or Formic Pro in Alabama in the summertime at all, because it does get extremely hot, extremely humid, and it's miserable here. And I, I think either one of those treatments would be too much unless I tried a half a dose of the Apigard. I know some folks, um, locally some commercial guys i think down in the panhandle of florida have been having issues with the effectiveness of some of the products they've been using and so i i know at least one of them has told me he used apigard in the summer at, you know half dose like i discussed if i'm not mistaken and had real good success and so i think 
you just gotta, I think you just really have to deal with the temperatures. Just, that's my very minimal brief experience with it using it one time this past fall. Hmm. How about you, Greg? Have you, have you found that it cu cuts back in the brood laying at all? Uh, severely. Um, and again, folks who are listening to uh, the Nature's Image Farm podcast, a question asked earlier out of Tom Nolan about the Queens. Uh, uh, he suspects one plus one would be easier on the Queens, but his experience is that uh, two strips does not uh, really experience queen loss. So I wanted to uh, get that comment on there. That's, yeah. a, that's a big deal. Yeah, um, and there's science behind that too. I mean, Randy Oliver, I, I, like he's take him at face value. He, he gives you what he sees and that's what he sees too. He says, Ian, there's no, there's no queen issues that I can find or no. He, I'm talking like I'm talking to him, but it's through, right. uh, right. you know, media and that. Right. But it's uh, it's something that is out there though like there's experience out there that it is an issue so i get i got to figure out what is causing the situation that's causing these queen losses if it's just straight up temperature or if there's some other situation at the time these beekeepers are applying these products and what are they doing as they're applying these products or maybe it's a synergy with something else that we're not aware of what's going on that's causing some of these casualties it's so it's something and Tom's probably just rolling because he's, you know, you know we're, we're talking about his product and we're throwing all these variables out there. And he's like, he's probably wondering whether or not we have enough data behind what we're talking about here. But maybe as we I proceed this summer and try to use some of these products, maybe he can help me guide through some of these issues to make sure that I use it appropriately. The guidance is a big thing, I see, sure. I, I think, especially with... Uh, all these beekeepers using off-label products, they're using these products without the guidance of study behind them or guidance of the application or the medium or all these other conditions. And they're almost on their, in their own trying to navigate all these murky waters where the registered products come in, it's been tested. There's science around uh, the process and, and everything involved in trading and you have the people providing you the assistance to be able to use these products appropriately. So anyway, that's just, because well, there's, uh, there's uh, some, uh, I'm just hearing hints of off label here, but there's also off label in regards to oxalic mm -hmm. and it's highly promoted and it's effective in some places it's not effective in other places. And there's all these questions, well, what is going on? You know, and the matrix we're using to be able to administer this product, you know, there's variances and differences everywhere. So there's a, there's a lot of places I think our industry needs some help here, but anyway, um, I, I stepped on you, Greg, I'll let you no, carry on. Why it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. How everything is continually tied together. Once you're, once you can look at it that way, uh, I, I am not a guy who believes um, uh, in coincidences, but today um, I wanted to reach over to this this stack of magazines um, that I have. Um, and this one here is of Gleanings and Bee Culture from May of 1965. I just, I was, it was literally a random woo woo alert. This, it was a random snag out of this entire stack over here. Okay. And the first page that I flipped it open to is this. Let's see if I can. Bees die. Unknown, unknown causes. causes. <laughs> okay. Now, this is May of 1965. We say it all the time. It's, it's in Proverbs. There's nothing new under the sun. We'll maybe read this later once we get through all this conversation, if we have um, some spare time. But uh, in conclusion, they don't know. They were trying to figure it out. They were calling it a spring dwindling um, where hives are dying out in the wintertime or they're not worth a hill of beans in the spring. And they're trying to figure all these things out. I think it might have had something to do with pesticides, might have had something to do with viral loads. But these, you're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this and I'm getting goosebumps because it's a lot of the things that we talk about now, these unknown factors. You know, we're trying to put these strategies and plans together. But the fact of the matter is, there is so much else going on that even the slightest little nuance uh, can create a, a potential synergy um, or, or just uh, compound um, the result one way or the other. So that's something to keep in mind. We'll touch back on that later. But uh, Ian, regarding thymol, um, thymol in a lot of ways has been a saving grace. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I've learned how to kill bees with formic. I've learned how to kill bees with thymol. 
I've learned how to murder bees, even with oxalic acid. And we can talk about that as the conversation develops. With my experience with Apigard is using in the tubs, using it with the syringes, uh, 50 gram or 50 milliliter um, doses right from the syringe on a card. Um, folks are pretty familiar with that. No new territory there. Um, but what I had found is the name of the game for us is thresholds. And so if I'm, a, if I'm in somewhere that two to six range, I'm pretty okay with thymol and oxalic acid historically. Um, I had a, a happy little accident, as you would say, and never got my thymol cards off, my Apigard cards off last winter. It was last winter, Brian, or the year before. I, I can't remember now. But anyways, the crystal stayed in the colony all year long. And according to Apigard, Vita B, um, thymol works because the thymol is suspended in gels. The bees get it on their hairs, on their bodies. They carry it through the colony. Um, and what's interesting uh, to think about is that according to Apigard, as opposed to other pyrethroids, thymol disrupts cell membranes and affects all cellular um, performances. That there's no resistance yet found to it. It's it's operating differently than some of the neurological or systemic approaches from some of the other products. Why does that matter? Well, I I have a theory. I, well, I have field experience that shows me the, the colonies that I accidentally left the cards on, which is obviously anti-label. All those, I had 100% survival rate on those colonies. The colonies that I either A, pulled cards out of, um, um, or B, didn't get cards, they didn't make it. Um, but it was a step, it was a, it was a ladder. The ones that only got um, osalic, I had this survival rate. The ones that had osalic with the cards pulled were at here. And the ones that had o repeat osalic and thymol, were nearly 100% survival rates in those yards. And to me, that was a happy little accident because it, I'm trying to figure what does that really mean? Were my numbers too high going into the fall? Did that somehow keep just running them out, running them out, running them out? However, um, as good as that might sound, I murdered 120 um, nukes in my nuke yard that, uh, that I was overwintering for, for spring splits. You, you do the math on small scale, you know, nukes that are in five over fives that you can split out into 240 nukes for sale at $200 a piece. It's a pretty significant loss at, at our small scale or, or any scale. Um, in that situation, um, I think the Apigard 100% ran those colonies plumb out of those boxes because they were complete abscons. Why that matters is in the learning yard this year, in the same yard, the same bees that were stressed by Formic, on two of those colonies, we put um, Apigard in. One of them, they completely absconded within two months. There, were any, there wasn't even any bees that made it to Christmas. They were completely gone. Those bees were, were too stressed. So it, it keeps going back. Bees that are highly stressed or might be affected heavily virally, when we were throwing these things out to clean up later, I think it's just too much. They are absolutely hitting. The, they're heading for the hills. They're out. Um, so thymol has been extremely effective for us. Um, at the same time, we have found the line where Apigar, even at smaller dosages, um, quarter doses, ran the bees out of those nukes, five frame deep singles and five frame over five frame deeps. Um, it, it, we, had, we, we had very terrible um, results um, with did, it. Did he use the same dose on the, the nukes as he did on the, no. uh, the singles? The, was cut the doses were cut back. I think we were... We, we did it per frame. We, we took, we took on average uh, a five gram dose per frame for a single to get us to 50 on a regular single. I think we were, we were shooting for 14 to 18 um, milliliters on the nukes. So a, a, a pretty low dose, very low dose, even lower than what it recommended that I think don't hold me to it. I think they recommend 25 gram doses on smaller colonies and a lot of these instructions are challenging because you don't find it on their website. These, these instructions for lower dosages is on the bucket on the pullout tab. Um, so. Yeah, that's not acceptable. I mean, that's, that's, that's tremendous casualty. That costs a lot of money. That's what I'm scared of. It's just, just exactly that. Uh, and you can't say that's misapplication because you were following the directions on that accordingly. Right. right? Yeah, yep. so that's that, that's tough. No, what no, conditions? no, I wasn't. Uh, no, yes and no, no, because where 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 we went a little sideways 
is they also got a salic acid four days later. So there, there might have been a combination of mitocides, oh. if, if we want to call it a mitocide, a combination of osalic acid and thymol within the same window that ran them out. Son of a gun, it might be a synergy then going on there. Could be. Hmm. However, I that's I would, something we I need would, to know. I would say here here's where I'm on the fence with that. The other um I can't even think of how many how many four ways we had out there that we did all let's just say on average a hundred colonies that we treated with osalic acid same day that we applied thymol and came back four days later and hit him with osalic and hit and came back four days later and him with osalic. So we had three osalic treatments with a 50 gram dose on these singles, those colonies that I did that to and that the thymol card stayed on was nearly a hundred percent survival. So in those instances at that size box and that configuration, there was not a synergistic issue as far as me looking at it as a farmer in the field and reading the, reading the critter. But when we get into nuke boxes, it's different altogether. Somehow I, even I, the same I, frames of bees stacked up vertically something different's going on. Hey, Greg, was it all at the same time of the year? It was. Same exact time. Yep. Same time, same, or the same, they were all splits that we had made for all intent and purpose. I mean, identical sets of bees. Um, the only difference is they were two miles, uh, or about, yeah, about two miles away, and uh, the box configuration was really the only difference. Uh, yeah, so that's no good. I'm thinking of using uh, thymol. I, I was, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm scared of it affecting the brood nest. Like, okay, let's, uh, my, I, I'm pretty much set on my formic treatment. If, if Tom, maybe, Tom can buy me supper. <laughs> I'm going to buy <laughs> formic to be able to do my June treatment because I'm getting, uh, kind of married to that thought just because it's a different swing of a hammer um there's going to be casualty i'm just going to have to deal with it i'm hearing like i have all this horse here i'm hearing but i'm also i'm hearing positive effects of using pharmac uh just the colony seem just to you know afterwards rebound and produce there's something about it maybe it spurs on the hygienic nature within the nest or i don't know what's going on but they just seem to produce these fantastic brood nests after they tell me and it's just off to the races another hammer being swung at that mite and you know there seems to be less mite issue from the beekeepers i'm talking to less mite issue with this product uh, worked into a apivogard or some other type treatment and down the line so you know that, that rotation is true there so i think i'm going to try to get my experience and bearings around that to incorporate it so then after that in the summer leaving the summer i'm hoping to be able to use an extended uh, oxalic acid re release pad or pad or towel or whatever and hopefully we have it uh, approved up here in canada so i can legally use it and it's going through the regulatory process right now and it was promised to us this spring and then things are being delayed and not sure if it'll be ready for the summer but maybe it'll be ready for later in the season i hope and if I can, then maybe what I'll do is I'll use the ex extended release oxalic right when the boxes come off just to try to hold those mites down through a very critical point of time where those hives are building that brood nest for winter. And I say that I don't want to put a product in like Formic at this time because we get variability in heat swings and I don't want to have the casualty because of that. But I don't want to use thymol because of my experience of making a small brood nest. I want that queen to keep brooding and not to retard yeah. that brood nest, right? So that's maybe where I can put this oxalic extended and then use maybe go into a thymol treatment later on in the fall, let's say in October, when things are a little bit, you know, cooler, the brood nest, the winter nest already established itself. And this is the point of time, maybe I could target those mites and take advantage of the, uh, the, the effect of it shutting down the queen, because this is when I want the queen to be shut down. So if I could put that tr product in, use it a two-edged sword, one to kill the mites, two to completely cease brood rearing. So then I can follow up later on in October or in, uh, close November before I bring them into my building with complete broodless 
nests and I can get them without oxalic acid vapor or dribble at that time. I was having trouble this last fall. Some of the variability I was finding was I think it was directly related to the mite infestation within my colonies. And I was finding that the colonies <clears throat> that were healthy, that had very low mite counts, were birdless uh, late in the season. And my oxalic acid vapor treatment seemed to knock a lot of mites, or not a lot of mites down, but it seemed to, you know, there's mites on the board. It's kind of like cleanup, but there's there's no brood there. And my, my tests were predictable. Uh, my washes were predictable. But as soon as I got into hives with more mites, it seemed like those colonies started rearing more brood for some reason. I'm mm. not sure. There seemed to be a correlation between mite and especially the one I walked into at 25%. It's like, whoa. Mm. And there's a frame and a half of brood in there, open brood. And I come back a little bit after, took a white mite wash, and I only counted like 5% of my because those mites went underneath the brood cappings again. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not like that situation isn't helping the bees. <laughs> it isn't helping their mite situation because we're, we're not able to, to target those mites later on. So if I can use that thymol to knock that brood nest off, so then I can more predictably treat those mites without any brood in the colonies, I think they'll be better for it in that way. Does that make any sense to you? It, it does. And I think that's what we are seeing here too. I, there, there might be a slight caveat uh, to consider. Um, we have really put a lot of focus on Caucasian genetics. And so they on their own are already kind of downsizing uh, going into the fall. So when we hit them with thymol in the fall, they're already downsizing on their own. I don't worry about that a whole lot because I, I've got colonies that can overwinter in two, three frames of bees and come out beautiful and explode and be yeah. profitable, prolific colonies. If I was running something... Um, and I don't want to get into the, this, this race is better than that. But if I got into a, a, a bee that required or, or would just wasn't going to stop or they couldn't be as frugal with the resources, I, I might be a little concerned with shutting them down unless there's, there's this fine line. And, and what I found is throughout this year, um, luckily my wife, Susie and the kids, we can get out there with our instant vapes and they can just start blasting the colonies. If we're at like 0.5 to 1.5, what, what worked really well for us is keeping them static with osalic acid until we got them to the point in time where we could put something a little bit heavier on. That really helped us continue to make, um, make the splits, um, keep everything healthy, and then have no fear of uh, knocking the brood down. The last thing in the world that I want to do in June is put thymol on and have my, have my brood crushed or my queens start to shut down for even two or three weeks. Because that's what our focus is, is making so many bees out of the bees that we have. We can't afford that. So there's this weird balance. It's going to be different for everybody. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm also, as we're talking, entertaining the idea of, of potentially using formic when it's cooler, like you, and then uh, following up a little bit later in the year for what we're doing, going static, using OA vapor to keep them static. Uh, keep and we're, we're monitoring constantly. Um, the thing about the thymol that I also like going into the fall um, is while yes, it does sh uh, shut the brew down. I I mean I am 100% sold on it because I've seen it so many times over and over and over again. Use that to our advantage. Get the brood shut down, um, and then for me, cleaning up with the salic acid is so quick. It's so easy, and then especially right at solstice, hit it, zap them again. To me, there's a for the, the dollar and cents for what I'm getting out of it. It makes it to me like I'm pretty convinced, and that that could be a problem too. But it seems to be working out really good. The 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 trouble spots are coming out of the spring to make sure that everything is good to go, and then that really critical time in the summer as we lead to the fall at the right time, putting the right product in to make sure our bees are healthy and ramping and doing what they need to get into that fall um, establishment. What what concerns do you have? Um, Ian with, you know, outside of, let's say, pr outside of price points, right? Because that, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, when it comes to losing a colony, that, that, to me, it doesn't matter if it costs $3 a colony or seven to keep them alive. That's, that's a no brainer. Um, but what, what considerations do you have coming out of the spring and, and timing of these products? Is this where, what, what, what is leaning, what is 
why are you steering away from Apigard or uh, I'm sorry, Apivar so many times in a row? And you're thinking about plugging that something, that different hammer in. Well, yeah, in the spring, our season, I think we're very fam familiar with our climate type uh, between you and I, Greg. Yeah. I think we're somewhat the same, except I would say I'm a little bit more condensed like this. Okay. I think I, I maybe don't have maybe quite the freedom, like we we're talking freedom in like a couple of weeks of freedom where you can maybe apply something else and then get forgiven because things will fix itself. In the spring, we're just so cold and slow sometimes. And we need to be able to use a treatment that's easy on the bees and just like almost foolproof, put it down, kills the mites and let that work. It, it has to be like that. There's, we, got, we need a product first thing in the spring. It's so very important. Uh, to use it where all these complicating variables don't affect what's going on. That's where the beauty of Apivar is, or a chemical treatment like that, because it fits the mold to that. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it, you, it, it, it decreases the amount of mistakes the operator can make to be able to fulfill the proper treatment of that, if that makes any sense. So I'm, that's in the way I'm married to that type of treatment right out of the shed, because it's so very important how you set the nest up for not only that spring, but for the summer. And if you have escalating counts because you didn't do your job in the summer or in the spring, then you're going to have a heck of a time controlling those counts going down into fall. So spring is probably one of the most important times of treatment. Uh, and I focus on that. And so, so I'm going to be using the Apivar again, just because I can't see any other treatment other than just compounding, hitting them with uh, oxalic acid in the spring. I just don't trust that. So I'm going to have to use a product, even if it's 75% effective or whatever, I got to use that. But that's where the formic comes in after is maybe mm -hmm. to fix the problems that haven't been fixed by that first one. So I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. But mm -hmm. I was just talking to a beekeeper before I come on here about other, uh, about nutrition actually. And he was before I, uh, we're on zoom and before we uh, hung up he's saying i got some feedback for you Ian. i watched your last video and and he said i do you mind if i tell you straight up of what you're doing wrong and i said well <laughs> give it to me i love it, it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, so he said in your he said a lot of the beekeepers in this area they, they just use that um, oxalic acid vapor in the fall and then maybe another supplementary treatment in the spring he said you said in your video that you're having trouble with efficacy and consistency and all this kind of stuff. And you're leaning away from vapor. He said, don't, don't be an idiot. It, it vapor gets the product in there very quick and it's affordable and it's effective. He said, you're not using it properly. And I said, okay, well teach me. He said, what you're doing is uh, you're getting the product in there with, he doesn't care what type of device it was. You, you get it in there, but he said, you're making a big mistake by not closing up the entrance. And I said, well, what's the importance in that? I said, I'm using a four gram treatment just for the waste because I expect some waste mm -hmm. to come out. But he's saying, well, what you're doing is, he said, I watched your videos. He said, you're blasting it in, but it's blasting out as fast as it's blasting in. You're not keeping the product within the cavity of the, the, of the colony. Yeah. In, in, in the envelope, you got you to treat it and trap it in there so it doesn't have any place to go. So then it, it, it secures itself onto the bees, onto the cluster and penetrates and, and mm. does what it's supposed to do. So he said, even though you're overdosing a little bit, it's all going out the front anyways. And he said, when those bees, they bees hate it. And you see it when, when you vape a, a nest, they'll fan and they'll try to get it out. He said, that's not helping you either. You, you need to close it up and trap it in there. And he said, then you'll find that you're going to get more consistent, consistency out of your product. And maybe he's right. And I'm thinking about that. Yeah, because I'm not closing my entrance up because it has okay. been advised. And I'm yeah. doing it just because I think I'm managing or mitigating the situation by adding, increasing my dose. Right. So I'm going to maybe fall back on pulling out the vapor treatment and try with maybe a little more in my boxes. My goodness. <laughs> I need to improve my boxes. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> Be some investment yeah. there, right? <laughs> I, I, but he, maybe something I got to do. Yeah. Ian, how much brood is in those colonies coming out of the shed? 
there's an opportunity to there too, Bruce, because there's very little coming out of the shed. I used to argue zero, but that's not right. There is just a little bit. There's winter brood, and it's not something that you'd recognize as a brood frame, but there is brood. It's just kind of shotgun patterned like this all over the place. Sure. Once they get out, that queen goes to town, and then she starts laying her brood nest. So we have about a week before we get them out. So have you, I mean, oxal OAV is pretty mild, isn't it, on the bees? So would that be a time, or maybe you do it already to hit them with OAV as soon as they come out when you drop them, or? Uh, we probably be- should, and we probably could, but it's, there's that time thing. I, maybe yeah. I need to hire another two guys to help, because it takes about four days or five days if we're, okay. you know, and it's cold, and you're, we only have about four or five working hours in the spring. It, like, oh. What I was trying to get at earlier was our spring is condensed and it's not favorable to yeah. those types of treatments. I feel, I don't know. It's just hard. Whereas yeah, if know. you know treatments later on in the fall, things are a little bit more predictable, maybe a little freer, more bees, more warmth, more opportunity and everything. But in the spring, they were in snow banks still. And it's just yeah, it's tough. Yeah. It's just awkward. It's greasy and muddy and it's one thing I, last thing you want to I'll, do. Yeah. I was just pondering hitting them with OAV if possible, and then maybe putting the Apigardi or Apivar in there. Um, I don't know how quickly you could do that, if that would have a cumulative effect or not, but just the thought I had, I didn't know. Yeah. And then we're putting patties out at the same time too. <clears throat> like, no. I do need more hired guys. I put it all in Carrie's shoulders <laughs> before the school kids come. <laughs> it's just a lot of work. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. It takes time that's to do everything. Yeah. That's, you know, we're, you laugh about it, but one of the, one of the, the biggest contributing factors um, to us losing less bees really hasn't been dialing in perfectly which products we use. It's being consistent with whatever, whatever it is that we're actually using. Um, when my wife Susie and the kids go out and, and they're out just nailing those colonies every four days, even early spring, I really, do, I really do think it makes a big difference. But there's a lot of time, truth be told, that you get into certain parts of the year and you are just struggling to, to just stay, keep your, keep your face above the water. Um, and you can only do so much. And I think a lot of my, um, history of not intentionally letting things slide, but there is just, there are too many irons in the fire. You can't get to all the, all the colonies, you can't do all the things that you want to do. And so you're in a constant, uh, evaluation of, okay, what's, what's critical and then work your way down the list. Um, Ian, what does so you've talked about coming out of the spring? Maybe you'll hit them with OA. You're you're gonna uh, put your Apivar in there. Apivar is something that I I've, I've um, I have some experience with, meaning I've I've seen it in many commercial yards. Um, I there's been a lot of hesitancy on a lot of us putting faith in it because of whatever rash of concerns a lot of folks had over the last three years with concentrations. Um, but overall, what what are the cons that you see other than a potential um, resistance or a potential synergy with anything else? What are the cons that you are seeing with using Apivar, if any? Any brood loss? Yeah, no, no, I don't that's see beautiful. anything like yeah. that. I do see, uh, yeah, that's actually not true. I do see one thing um, coming out of the shed. These bees are stressed. They've been inside for a long time. They're ready to fly. They're ready to void. Um, yeah, I set them down in the yard. They make their spring poop. You know, they go out and fly mm-hmm. and they cleanse themselves. I find the time when we get through and drop the strips down into the colonies that they get really shitty all of a sudden. There's like, mm-hmm. they got to relieve themselves again. And I think that's a stress thing. They probably are stressed from the chemical that we're putting into the colony and they're just doing the same thing as any other animal would when they get stressed and they go out and they poop right <laughs> so i don't know maybe that's what i'm seeing but i do see that and in a stressful year year like we had this last spring where it's cold and draggy and just this the winter would not end until midway through may it seemed you know, i held off on that uh the apivar right off the start because i was afraid of exactly that <laughs> i had a lot of canola honey in my nests and the bees wow. were very shitty and they are just doing unusual things, and I didn't want to add that extra stress to them at their most vulnerable point of time. So I 
you know, there's a lot of factors went around why I didn't yeah. get my Apivarin in time, but that's one of them is I just dragged my heels to put it in a little bit later just to help them get through a very stressful point of time. So that is one thing I find. Yeah. And just to comment on another thing uh, that you mentioned, oh, just lost my train of thought. Uh, it's all about manpower. And maybe I'd build, you know, I have 1,500 hives. I feel I'm maxed out and I try to get a little bit more and the bees slap me down to 1200 or whatever. And I build myself up because that's where I, you know, that's my place. Well, maybe if I just hire some more employees right off the start, it'd help me get my work done. So then my bees stay alive so that I can keep a little bit more colonies, right? That's a dynamic that we have mm -hmm. to sort out ourselves. There's, there's all these things we've got to figure out, right? So, yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you look at that before I go, I'll, I'll let you guys get back to your live here. It kind of uh, uh, dominated a lot of the conversation. But you look at Randy Oliver's mite model, and this is what the beekeeper told me too before I got on with you guys talking about mites. You look on there and you, you give an oxal oxalic acid vapor or a drizzle, whatever, it knocks them down, let's say, let's even say 80%. So you come down, hit them a second time, you're killing 80% of the 20% the that's residual in there. And you hit them a third time in there, you're knocking that 80% of the residual of that 20% that of that other 20%. You know what I mean? So that, that escalating kill off going into winter, you've absolutely almost controlled all your mites going into winter. And that's a very important aspect, especially here trying to keep bees inside a winter shed for so long. If you have any mites on the bees, lights out, right? So we need to keep our mites at pretty much zero but also it starts you at a very healthy number in the spring so then you're you know the progression of the mite expression throughout the year starts almost at zero again and they have to build themselves up so then your continual mite treatments are more effective all the way through so that, that late season oxalic is a neat, neat trick and i think just gonna have to play around to make sure that we actually get that to work properly right so yeah <laughs> Yeah, Ian, I appreciate you taking some time uh, to talk to us about, um, you know, some of these ins and the outs, why some of these things work, when the an appropriate time, why um, they, they may or may not uh, be feasible in all our own operations. It makes a, a huge difference as we all kind of develop our own strategy for our individual um, apiaries. You guys, do you have any questions for Ian before we cut him loose? I had a quick question with regards to the OAV. We, I think we touched on it a little bit, but... Down here in the south, honestly, we never go. Some colonies do go completely broodless, but most, a lot don't. Most colonies don't go completely broodless. So my question for you is, with oxalic acid vapor, if you treat them, like you mentioned, hitting them two or three times, I think, if, if you hit them several times, like in a three to four day intervals, if you can, even five, even if you hit them four or five weeks in a row, five to seven days apart, do you think it's possible to not might to knock the mite load down doing that, or do you think it's just going to hold them at bay? Um, if there's, some, I mean, not even a lot of brood, but just some brood in the colonies. People always say if there's brood, it does. It's not effective, but I I don't know that I believe that 100. percent I know that it's not going to kill all the mites. I understand that, but if you hit them at a certain frequency, what are your thoughts on that? Because, yeah, that's a good thing. That's an interesting comment. I don't exactly know how to answer that, just other than my own experience. And, uh, well, I think uh, I'm pretty sure it was Randy Oliver tested exactly that. It took multiple, 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 multiple treatments to be able to get that mite count down. <clears throat> and I can relate that. I, I can kind of see that just by what I've seen this last fall in the mite migration between... Um, no brood like uh, when i come upon this 25 percent mite count colony there is no brood other than a sheet and a half of open brood and i come back in a few days to do another sample on it uh, and that brood started to cap over it went from 25 percent down to five percent just like that so those mites wow. migrated underneath those capping so that's telling me there's a lot of mites under those cappings at all times, right? Mm -hmm. And I, like when I first brought oxalic acid into my mite treatment regime, 
It's the first time I've ever used it because I was see seeing initial uh, problems with Apivar at that time. I didn't know what else to do. So this neighbor of mine had one of those great big California cannons and he didn't know how to use it. It wasn't working. He said, even if you can get this thing to work, you can use it. Just show me how to use it after. So I took and I figured it out. I blasted those bees. And that first round I made, it didn't make any difference on my mite counts. And I looked down, I said, well, this is disappointing. So I looked down in the nests and they still had brood within their, within the clusters. So I thought, okay, maybe what I'm seeing is a mite drop, but my mite counts are staying static because this, this winter brood is emerging and I'm seeing those new mites coming through. So then I waited a week, I think it was a week and a half or so until I was confident that there was less brood in there, did around and I knocked my mite counts right down to one. Right. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is I think brood is a big factor when you're trying to use oxalic acid. And I always said, you got to do it when there's no brood in your colonies. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm thinking maybe I could employ a strategy with thymol, which might, you know, bring that colony cease its brooding because of that treatment, which will provide more of a consistent brood nest throughout my entire operation as I'm then trying to target it with uh, oxalic acid vapor because maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm seeing inconsistency with vapor with my mite shakes and my treatments and everything just because there's probably brood in there I'm not seeing throughout the treatments you know so I hope that answered you that's just a lot of rambling conversation sure. around the question you, well you know? I will tell you the uh, last winter I had my epimate colonies here in the backyard and and I had not treated them I had neglected them and now it was late November December I'm sure they weren't brooded all the way down, though, but I hit them, I think, five, four or five weeks in a row. And the Apimate hives are interesting because they have the tray on the bottom. And so you can just clean it, treat, and pull it out and see in a few days how many mites have dropped. And yes. I think I had the first two times I did that, the first two weeks on one particular colony, I think I had probably hundreds, if not thousands of mites. It was horrible. And then I went ahead and continued to treat, and each week it got to be a little bit less and a little bit less until at the end there were almost no mites. And so, but I hit them. I just, it was an experiment just to see, but it was in the wintertime now. So there wasn't a lot of brood in there. There was, I'm sure there was still some. And so that, you know, I didn't take it out. I didn't go through the entire colony and see, but I just know that most of the colonies down here do have some brood. But it was an interesting experiment I did, but I, I hit them over and over and over again. But now I did wait. I usually have a three-day weekend and so i can hit them either the fifth day or the seventh day after i treat the previous time and so it was between five and seven days i think i hit them five or six weeks in a row but it took a while it did just happen with one or two treatments and that's what people ask me sometimes on my channel you know how many times do i need to treat with oxalic acid and i'm like you know i guess if they're totally broodless maybe once or twice but sometimes you know i think hitting them three or four times i i always try to do that if i can and, uh, but it's, it's just a down here, they start taking off so fast. Like right now, my bees are building up that it's just hard to keep up. It's hard to figure it out. Um, before you know it, it, it goes from, you know, their lowest point December to all of a sudden now beginning of February. And they are just double deeps packed with bees. Just I've slowed down because we're just barely starting to get drones. I need to split them, but they're going to have drones and be in the trees like overnight because it just happens so fast here. And so, um, it's, it's to, I know it's incredibly different, but the bee basics are the same wherever you are. And so, um, yeah, man, and, and you're, you're monitoring too. So that helps you figure out what's going on. Right. I think making assumptions is the worst thing beekeepers do a lot of times just following through with an action and not following up to see if that action actually worked. Cause sometimes it doesn't, you know, then we got to sort ourselves through those situations, but I got to run, I got to, I got to take off here. Um, I appreciate the sounding board, guys. This has been, I don't know if it's useful for anybody else, but it's useful for me anyways. <laughs> it's its quite intimidating to, uh, you know, express concern like this and not really knowing what's going on and asking for guidance. And I just want, one thing I just want to mention to maybe some of the beekeepers listening here, um, this conversation is going on with professional beekeepers the same kind of questions i'm bringing up here in this kind of unknown territory that we seem to be in a lot of beekeepers will provide you with the impression that they know what they're doing and they know what's going on that's all bullshit when they when they actually get to you and start talking to you honestly they're scrambling and they're asking for those answers just the same as 
what I did here. And they're all conveying this information and this kind of, is it right, is it not right kind of platform because nobody really knows what's going on because there's so many things involved with controlling mm -hmm. the mites. We're trying to control a bug on a bug, right? It's just like, how do you do that effectively? And how do you manage all those casualties? How do we manage on scale? How do we fit it within our philosophies and all this? So it's a conversation everybody's having. So we can't be afraid to reach out and ask questions and look for guidance in using these products because it's very important we use them properly. And I'm sure we'll we'll figure it out. It's just we need a collaboration like this, I guess what I'm getting at, collaboration like this is good because we can put it mm -hmm. out in the open and maybe we can learn from mistakes. Like uh, Greg, you made some terrible mistakes here. <laughs> I got really good at those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's so I can use your mistakes and maybe yeah. I can make maybe see yeah, go make some new ones, and then you'll tell us all about those, and we'll, we'll just keep tightening up this mistake curve, hopefully, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's what it's all about. Ian, thanks for for, uh, for joining us here on the Nature's Image Farm podcast, the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel, the Stream Team Beekeeping Chat. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation tonight. We're going to get into the lethality of osalic acid, how much osalic is too much, and can you run some bees out? We're going to keep that conversation going uh, but Ian, thanks again for joining us tonight. We're looking forward uh, to seeing what what strategic plan you put together um, for the rest of this year. And one one little bug I want to put in your ear to keep an eye on is I think there's something going on where we're finding some colonies are washing zeros, um, and some colonies are washing 30 percent or 25 percent. And for some reason, those colonies just keep plugging away. There's something else going on here with viral lo viral loads, viral expressions. And how that imparts onto the bees. And I want to have that conversation with you like this again, maybe this time next year. But for now, thanks for joining yeah. us. And then tie nutrition into the conversation. Oh, I mean, boy. <laughs> this, this, this is where beekeeping gets interesting. There's so many aspects we can talk about, right? And this is why these conversations always last three and a half hours. <laughs> right. Thanks for your time anyway, tonight, Ian. Yeah, I got to run. So thanks, guys. We'll see Ian, you. Ian, take care. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, this wow. is where the thinking gets done, um, and this is oh, where yeah. it's important for, for a lot of folks to have these conversations and be open um, with failure, where, where, what seems like failure, and be able to share, you know, what seems like a terrible mistake. I'm all about, you know, um, we're uh, speaking at the, um, the Honey in the Hills, the West Virginia Beekeeping Association Conference um, here coming up in, Mar uh, in March. You can go to um, Mountaineer Beekeep beekeeper beekeeping.com we'll get some links um but what's going to be yeah. interesting is what i like to do at at um when i'm speaking with bee clubs i'm more at a conference is i like to share the hard lessons learned it's easy to get up here and say i did all these things great and i think <clears throat> there's there's so much bias when we think we're successful and how we share that message that that information to me isn't is nowhere near as useful as someone who said i don't know why I don't know how, but I just murdered a bunch of bees. Here's what I did. Let's talk this through. And let's let's try to find the strategy to do better. I think that is the um, that is the the gold um, in in the sluice of the mind, where when you when you start to pan it out, these things happen. There's a lot a lot of nuggets that we just pulled um, together collectively, and I think there's going to be a lot more conversations that a lot of us are going to have moving forward with it. Um, before we get going. Um, we do have uh, a giveaway tonight on a hand-forged hive tool from Tim Byrne Jr. Um, we've got that to do. And um, guys, before we move on, any any initial quick takeaways uh, from our talk with Ian so far? Hmm. Ryan? You know, I mean, my takeaway is don't get static. Um, always be willing to adapt. And, and that's what I've learned. You know, if you get, so to say, too comfortable and you get yourself into just a, a static rhythm, it's probably not going to turn out good. So, you know, always, always uh, just keep yourself informed, keep yourself up to date. So um, I, I do want to share one thing, though, and that is this right here. Um this is the model that Ian was talking about. And then he also had in his last video for anybody that did see it. I will, um, 
I'll send the link of where I found this. This is Randy Oliver's, you know, um, model. Uh, that way Greg can plug it um, in the video. So if anybody is curious about that model and they want to use it, um, I'll make sure that Greg has the link so that you all can download it. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that that's uh, I, I enjoyed that. If you haven't seen that video, uh, go check out uh, Ian's channel. You can see um, him work through mentally plugging this in, taking this out and seeing the curve. It's a big deal to visually see these things uh, sometimes. And, oh, yeah. and those models are um, um, helpful just to give us a little bit uh, more. I don't want to say confidence or courage to to maybe take a different approach. Um, but it just it keeps the, the the gears in the mind working to say, okay, well, maybe if I do this, maybe if I do that, maybe this will be a big difference. Have you guys ever heard of a lethal dose of osalic acid to your bees? Have you heard of anyone killing or running their bees out with osalic? If in the comments here, everyone listening, um, if you're listening on the Nature's Image Farm podcast, thank you. If you're going to check out this uh, the replay uh, post on the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel, let us know in the comments. And if you're listening tonight live. Let us know in the comments, have you ever killed your bees with osalic acid? Uh, and if so, what happened? It's not something that's really talked about a whole lot. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, uh, operating in complete transparency, I've gotten fantastic at murdering um, mites, but I've got even better at murdering bees. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about that tonight so that we are painting an accurate picture um, of all of the products that we use so it doesn't look like we're just you know, favored to one method. Have you guys, have, have you guys ever killed bees with osalic acid, Brian, have you? So this is full transparency. I, I take it. Um, <laughs> so when I very first used ox oxalic acid, I did not, well, let me back up. I used spot on, what the label says at the interval that at that point we were provided with, you know, we were given information that said, use this dose at this interval. Here's oxalic acid. I did that. It did not work last year. Um, I used two caps. So we all know how much is in a blue cap, but I used two caps on every hive at intervals of four to five days. And I did like six treatments. So they got, you do the math. Grams. How many, you know, how many grams of bees? How they got grams? 10. Well, they were um, double deeps. So in double deeps, they got 10 grams and there might have been a little bit of a bulge on the top. So mm -hmm. they might have gotten 11 or 12 grams. Okay, and that so is one that is one to one point five grams per frame. Yep. How'd that and do? And I had zero issues. Yeah. Um, and we all know, like sitting right now, my colonies are eleven for eleven. <laughs> so, so no B, no, uh, no death or or uh, any any problems using us, Alec. Nope. Bruce, what about you? <clears throat> if anything, I would kind of go the opposite into that if uh, i've probably tip traditionally used kind of like brian said per label and i've increased that amount i've never i don't know that i've ever done as much as as what I don't know if i've ever done two complete caps uh basically 10 grams uh for per colony but i've never had issues that i know of killing bees if not if you don't unless you consider the bees that maybe died because it was not an effective treatment so I have not seen any particular issues with that. Um, one thing I will say that that is interesting to me is, I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you have, just kind of tipped the lid of a hive after, right after you treat. And it's very interesting to me. It's almost like the bees are drugged. Like they just, you know, they, they'll get a little bit it's feisty or fired up right when you're doing it. But if you tip that lid maybe a couple minutes after you treat and you look in there, they're fanning, but they're just, they seem like it almost drugs them. They're calm and it's kind of neat, but I've never had a lot of issues or any issues that I know of by either absconding or, or killing bees um, by using higher doses. Currently with the instant VAP, I've been using um, three to four grams on my colonies. Most of them, if it's a nuke, I drop it down a little bit, but I haven't had any issues. It just seems to really fumigate them. 
and I, I guess I could treat them twice to get more, but that's just kind of what I've been doing. Uh, the, the single deeps or the deep and mediums, I'll use, you know, three grams typically, and then I'll go up to four grams if it's anything more than that. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And, and I think it's been effective. I haven't done a ton of my counts recently, but the ones I've done seem to be pretty good. So no, no loss with you either. Nope. Greg, how about you? <laughs> well, I, the, I got the, a lot of comments here on the live. Um, this live chat is I don't see a single person who's commented. Everyone says no, 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 never killed him. No, 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 no. The list goes on and on. And no, Greg, I would say not that I know of now. I mean, you know, it, it's something, you know, and I, and here. So I'm going to be we um, I've had bad and a bad experience with the very old glow bug <laughs> pan style vaporizers. Um, I know a lot of folks who have murdered an entire colonies catching them on fire. That aside, that's not an osalic acid deal. That's that's an equipment deal. Um, using uh, the Larabi's uh, vaporizers that we love to use and we've used them now for years. Um, we have always used a blue cap and um, as Brian, Brian made a good comment here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I don't think we, it goes without being said, but Brian wants to especially let it, let it be known just, uh, to go on the record. Do not follow what I do in my apiary. I only recommend following the label. If you want a how to, then you need to go see Mike Barry and he'll, he'll let you know exactly how to. Um, so we've used, um, the, the standard and the macro, Larabi's um, and the instant uh, vape is our new favorite um, way uh, mm -hmm. to administer oxalic acid vapor. Um, with the standard and the macro Larabi's units, the blue caps hold five grams. I have just, for the sake of consistency, no matter if it's a five frame nuke, a 10 frame single, they always got blasted with uh, a cap, just a complete cap. And I never had a single bit of problem. And I mean never. Um, even a five grand cap on a three frame split that has an, a queen maybe uh, soonly emerging. You know, if it's a cell that's getting ready to hatch, not hatched yet, or she was already out um, and she was a virgin, no, no problems, zero problems. Um, but I have 100% found the lethal dose for osalic acid. Brian, you talked about you were at one and a half grams of osalic acid per frame of bees or so um i think i don't, I don't even know what uh, it, it's probably better we didn't um have this conversation with ian he's he has a little bit more um well i'll say this fringe treating has has been um in occurrence and has existed since we've been trying to figure this whole thing out um and it, it stems from farmers um uh, and bee farmers knowing that hey you know, whatever they say to use isn't working. And so I'm going to tweak, I'm going to dabble, I'm going to do this. Now, whether you think that's right or wrong, I'm going to leave that judgment for you. But what I'm going to say is that we've always used, without even knowing, way higher doses of osalic than even the recommended. It used to be one gram and now two, and now we're flirting with three or maybe four. The fact of the matter is we've been using five grams forever. Um, and it's been working well. But it's been working well in the right context to where we're near broodlessness, we're broodless, um, or we're using to keep things static. That's where osalic acid shines, where you can afford the time and the material to get in there and zap them. Okay, so what is the lethal dose of osalic acid? Brian, you're at one and a half, no problem. Even if you're heavy and you're at five grams for a nuke, that's, that's one on a three-frame uh, queen mating nuke, you know, one 1.2. So this there completely falls, and I bear the burden. Um, we had some fellas out um, helping us um, treat all of our colonies with osalic acid, and I gave the instruction that, to give every colony a blue cap, okay? But this is where when you are having folks out working with you uh, and you're delegating, that you have to be very clear on the instructions that you give. Because when I say a blue cap per colony, what I should have said is a blue cap per box. Okay, why does that matter? Here's where the lethal dose for osalic acid is for me. Um, we raise queens like we learned from Chris Warner, and it is full size frames. We use a lot of 10 frame boxes that are divided into three, where we'll have three mating nukes per 10 frame single. 
We've got big, beautiful queens that are mature. When we send them off, they are proven. They are laying up a storm. We've got frames of sealed brood. But here's the here's the challenge with osalic acid. The fellows did exactly what I asked them to. It was a five gram dose per colony. So in this situation, we were on the lean side of the population in each in one of those compartments. So in this configuration, we're talking about nine frames total, each divided into a its own compartment of three frames. Of those three frames, we may have only had a frame to a frame and a half of bees per colony, per compartment. So we did, we gave five grams of osalic acid for one and a half frames of bees. So in total, um, we were at one, you're at three, you're at four and a half, you're at almost, almost four to five frames of bees total on 15 grams of osalic acid. So somebody do the math on that. That's three, four, that is nearly four grams per frame of bees. Well, that's a heck of a lot more than the standard two to four grams for 10 frames of bees, isn't it? That's where we found some problems. We had colonies that were absolutely absconding. Um, we had colonies that they just, uh, it, it was almost as though the osalic acid burned up um, some of those young queens because they 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 just, they were some, they were bad wrong. I mean, eventually every single one of them collapsed or they, or they got run off. Um, and so the lethal dose, it was the, the lethality was absconding and complete loss of not only the queen, um, but all the bees on those frames. So you're talking a pretty significant loss in a mating yard um, where that happens. Okay. Um, and then potential physical, um, physical, uh, it was almost as though the wings seemed sinned from it. Um, so, yes, can, us, can you hurt your bees with osalic acid? You 100% can, but don't be a knucklehead. If you're going to have folks out working with you, give some clear instructions. A five gram dose for one and a half frames of bees in our context was too much. That was way, way too mm -hmm. much. Of course, in hindsight, that makes sense. You know, that's, that's a little too hot and heavy. Greg, I think one clarification here is, you know, um, we've talked about this before, but for new folks who may be on here, those who may not have heard it, I always thought that the blue cap, the blue cup was like one or two grams. So I was treating, you know, I was stacking those things up, filling up and then putting an extra little bit on there. Sometimes even doing two, I thought it was like one to two grams, but then mm -hmm. you weighed it and I weighed it and we mm -hmm. looked at the scale and it is five grams, which I was completely stunned by that. And so for folks who use any type of device that uses those blue caps or um, usually like the Larabi's or a Jono's Easy Vape, um, anybody who uses those type of, of devices, just know that those, ca those cups are five grams. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a shocker to me. I didn't believe it, Greg. You told me, I'm like, there's no way that that can't be five grams. And then you, you sent me a picture of it on a scale and I'm like, I'll be darned. And so then I'm like, I want to try my scale. <laughs> and sure enough, it was. So where was that's really important is, is we, I have never heard of a threshold that was actually too much for OAV. I've never heard it. Mm -hmm. I found it and I'm happy to share it. So um, 15 grams for about three to four frames of bees in total is way too much. So wow. if, if, to say it mm -hmm. again, 15 grams of osalic acid for us was way too much for about four, almost four frames of bees total, maybe almost five. Mm -hmm. too much. I would almost question that. I mean, if you're talking about 15 grams for that amount of bees, there's a stress factor there. So, you know, with that colony that size and they can't properly, they can't vent you know, it out vent that in one single box whether it was oxalic acid or any other type of vapor would that much vapor going into such a small colony cause an abscond regardless well and that's what we, we talked about it earlier and I, I i was um hoping to bring ian into that conversation but you know how we get we get two hours long in a hurry yeah um so yeah. to value his time we didn't i didn't want to drag that conversation on but everything that we've done um a uh, thymol on a stress colony runs them out. Um, mm -hmm. Formic, of course, uh, on a stress colony can run them out. Yep. Osalic acid in this situation can run them out. Our buddy at uh, uh, Anil at NKY Honeybees, uh, he thought two grams is fine. 
It is, but what we're talking about is 15 grams um, on on one 10 frame box that's divided in three, which in total only had about uh, four frames of bees in total in that box. It's a 10 frame divided into three. So you're getting 15 grams of oxalic acid circulating through that one box with that little bees in there. That that seems to be the problem. Um, and we have, you know, we have, it's probably a whole other show for another day on uh, tips and tricks for using oxalic acid. We have used it in the bottom board. We've, we've done it from on top and there is a massive difference on um, what it seems to be effective. When we go and treat underneath on the bottom board, the vapor goes up and it kind of circulates and then it settles. When we go on, and then the bees are coated and we've you crack the lid later, like Bruce mentioned, they're, they're fanning. There's, there's, there is a lot of oxalic coverage from the bottom. But when we've tried to go through the top and do it, it's almost like we're not getting, um, I don't know if convection is the right word, but the circulation, the venting to go through the colony, it wants to shoot down and go and go out and it doesn't really circulate through. And then we end up, it's some of it ends up on the bottom board or the sidewalls, but we got way less bee coverage with the oxalic acid crystals, or I guess whatever, I guess it would be crystals, micro crystals mm -hmm. that are left behind, way less surface coverage um, on the bees, but, but more importantly on the frames. So mm -hmm. that's just, a, we could talk, that's a whole other you know, thing. So. And, and not, to, not to keep going down this rabbit hole, but when I switched up my dosage, I also, I would always treat before on my lower deep, you know, you drill the little hole in. I switched that up this year to because i run double deeps so i would have the hole at the very bottom of my top deep so it was almost if you mm -hmm. looked at that <clears> structure <throat> i was almost hitting it directly in the middle gotcha yeah because you're under you're under the bottom bar of the frame yep i was yeah. under the top frames and above my lower so it's so blasting it on the fronts of the box and it's probably some's probably going up and over and some's going down and yeah. over and probably yeah I, I could see i could see that working there's yeah. there's so many different ways to uh yeah to do thing, all the treatments including thymol and formic even there probably shouldn't be but there is yeah one thing that um that ian mentioned was that his friend told him that i've i used to always block my colonies when i treated yeah, and then I kind of quit doing that because man, it just feels. It's, I mean, it's a lot. Oh, uh, vapors just flies everywhere out of those colonies with that instant vape. It comes out through the top and it cracks. It's just it's just coming out of that colony like totally fumigated. So I just kind of quit worrying about blocking the entrance. So maybe I need to go back to doing that. It does take extra time yeah. to do that. It's an extra step. And maybe do you do you guys block yours, I uh, Brian? I think you do. Do you do that, Greg, as well? Blue shop towels. I just have yeah. a, a either a pro nuke or a gesture box stuffed with them. And we just uh, zap them and close them up. And some of the videos this year, uh, I, I, there was two times that I treated this year that I didn't use those. Um, when we're using our, our nukes, we're uh, treating our nukes or our queen nukes that have dials on the front entrance dials. I usually just put a cork over my instant vape and then go right in the entrance and then blast them and then leave it alone. Um, but on, on anything, that they, we use all solid bottom boards. Um, which I think is helpful, especially for these kind of situations. Um, but on a pallet, you know, I only have a four inch opening mm -hmm. and that's it. And so the instant vat fits almost perfectly. That's true. In that entrance. And so while I'm treating, there's not a lot going on. One quick blue shop towel as I pull it out, mm -hmm. I just got to make sure um, you, you come pull them out. If you don't, if you forget to pull them out, for the most part, the bees will wiggle their way through and can get in and out, but you don't want to leave those things. My pellets have a little, my pellets have a little tiny crack in the back, I guess, for water drainage, water like if you tilted, and mm -hmm. so they they can get in and out of there. But I've I, that I, hopefully that that doesn't happen if ever very often. So, well, we're almost two hours, guys. I want to thank everyone who's hung on this long. With uh, thank Ian if he's listening back for his time. What do you guys say we go ahead and uh, as a way to say thanks for all the folks who have hung on uh, this long? We we go ahead and give away. Uh, this hive tool it is super beautiful. Um, this camera is not going to uh, do it justice, um, but look at the, wow. these are all hand punched. Look at the texture on that. Absolutely wow. gorgeous. Um, the backside also has kind of classic uh, rasp uh, yes, kind of texture. Yeah, wow. It does that have a awesome. 
Somebody was asking where they could get those. Is there a place they can, you can go uh, get a hold of Tim Burn Jr. Um, on Facebook? Uh, Tim, if you're listening, I'll, I'll get with Tim. I'll get his email address. And if he wants, um, I know he's a farrier by trade. So I don't know that he's, uh, when I asked him about that, he wasn't trying to go uh, into business selling these. He was kind of doing it as a way to say thanks uh, to the stream team for the content that we put out. I wanted to offer it to the audience. But, Tim, um, if you ever change your mind, let me know. We'll drop the links in this video. But it is – what's what's interesting about this is it is – it's so comfortable. Um, it just – it sits in your hand perfectly, um, and it's it's just gorgeous. It is, and, it, and it is not that heavy. It, it's not much heavier than a standard hive tool. So, anyways, um, beautiful work. He even has, a, has his name stamped in it, Tim Byrne. Look at that. So, that is that's awesome. a classic. That's a classic. Yep. It's it's piece beautiful. Of art, piece of art, actually. Yep. Uh, so you got you guys know the drill by now. Hashtag hive tool, and we'll get that shipped out to somebody. Again, I want to thank uh, Tim Byrne Jr. Uh, for reaching out and uh, uh, giving to the folks here. I want to thank the folks who've also gave super chats tonight. I really do appreciate you um, doing that. As we always say, that money kind of just goes back into the stream team savings account for us all individually, and we use that money. Or giveaways and things like that. So I really do appreciate that. Brian, you want to go ahead and um, hit hit the uh, spin it of fortune, spin it. I wanted to plug in a comment, but I held back. Wouldn't be fair. <laughs> Mister Nelson, Eugene Nelson, come on down. Look at that. He's won stuff before. Eugene, that's awesome. Okay, Eugene Nelson, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, go to our website at naturesimagefarm.com. Go to the contact tab. There you'll find our information. Reach out, and uh, we will get this to you. That's, that's super neat to be able to have um, something so cool to give away. You know, last time we gave away um, Yappy's traveling mug. We're actually threw it at Brian. And if you guys remember how that ended, it ended up with uh, me spilling a cup of coffee all over my all over the place here. What a mess that was. That that mug might make another appearance on another stream next week. Really? It might. We'll see. You just never know. Yeah, you never, know. never know. You never know. I, we're at two hours, and then I'd love to talk all night about these things. Um, do you guys have any? Uh, what are you guys working on this week, Bruce? Um, I'm just <laughs> just trying to keep up. Just trying to catch up. Uh, just quickly, as far as videos go, uh, I did post a short yesterday or last night of, of a crazy packed out colony that I've got that just really needs to be split. Now it's really not quite enough drones yet to use cells, but within a couple of weeks, there's going to be drones everywhere. But uh, the queen availability is an issue right now. And so I just am not, just can't do it yet. Our goal is to split starting the 1st of March. I've got some, we've got some cells lined up for then. So I hope I can keep them in the box until then. But then after that, I went up and I'm, I've got a long form video coming out. It's about, oh, it's probably four or five minutes long. It's not very long, maybe six. I think it's like four or five minutes, but it's great. It's a video about the horizontal hive with one of your nukes in there. And it's amazing the difference. Um, that great big, huge colony with probably 60,000 bees. And then the one that has yours in it, you'll see it's just, they're all condensed in a little small cluster. Yep. Like I'm like, it's, it kind of scares me. I mean, yep. honestly, I'm scared about it, but we'll see how they do coming out when that, when that flow really kicks in, we'll see how they do. Um, I'm just, I mean, I've seen small like carniolan genetics before and how they get small, but this is, you know, well, you can see if you watch the video. So don't, if you see the video, don't think there's anything wrong with that colony. Cause I think that's what they're supposed to do. Right, Greg. That's it. Uh, but that's I hope, I hope it doing. picks up. And, and I do have several of Greg's Queens, uh, as you know, and uh, they're kind of at various levels, but I think there has been some different flows happening in different BRs that I have as well, because some of them are, are busy and building up and others are not as much. And so it's amazing how within a few miles you can have a completely different timing yeah. on some things. And so that'll be interesting. Hopefully you guys will check it out. And uh, if you have any ideas or things you'd like to see on my channel, if you could just leave it in the comments or email me and I'll try to get them done for you. But really as far as the bees go, just trying to make sure Hopefully get everything in order because within a month from now, it's going to be just full out bee season here in this part of the country. Man, and we're man. right there at it, but man, we're just so close. We get more drones and we're going to start seeing bees in the trees and I'm start getting calls real soon. 
Cool. Brian, what's new for you coming up this week? Probably not much. I this next uh, this weekend will be my two week mark, so th- that's about my rotation that I have set every fourteen days. Just checking the fondant on the colony, so I'll be able to update everyone next week. Um, you know, if they're still eleven for eleven, um, I, I've kind of decided on the number that I'll have for this next year. So every, everybody's going to hear it right here on the nature's image farm podcast, YouTube channel, stream team chat. It's probably going to be 15. Um, I don't want to expand that. See, see there. See See that. Brian. (laughs) I don't want to expand that much where I, I just, I don't want to add any more time to the bees than what I already have. I just, I'm trying to regulate my time, but what I'm going to do and probably my challenge, and, and I know I'm going to have more than just that when I do splits and just managing swarms and things like that, but I'm probably going to end up setting up a little bit of a nuke yard just so that, you know, I can kind of manage my numbers and then I'm probably going to find people that can, take some nukes for me. <laughs> so Uh-oh. I no guess problem. it's a problem. Great dog talk, Brian. You're stepping out. That's good. Stepping That's out. good, man. That's it's fun to, to stretch yourself and uh, yeah. do some different things. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It might, it might be more difficult to try and figure out how to keep a smaller number of colonies than to grow though, honestly, but yeah, you got and to try and get rid of them and, it might be easier just to let them grow and just grow your numbers. <laughs> those bees, when they, when they multiply, they multiply. But, but yeah. if you can find a place to put them, it, that's a great, that's a great, uh, great plan there to go ahead and just yeah, um, find homes for the others. That's yeah, cool. yeah, that's all. That's all. Yep. So that's that's awesome. Uh, next, uh, the next stream team chat will be on whose channel next Wednesday? Who's next? Brian. Is it? I think it's. I think it's mine. It is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. Awesome. I know uh, this. This uh, Sunday night. Stay tuned uh, to uh, the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel. Uh, Susie and I will be doing a show uh, this Sunday night uh, at 8 p.m. where we're going to be talking about spring prep. There is. If you are not already planning for spring, you might find yourself uh, in a pinch chasing your tail um it's it's uh, there's a lot to talk about uh so getting prepped and, and prepared for spring uh susie and i are going to talk about it so come join us at the nature's image farm youtube channel live chat 8 p.m the homestead chat with uh, greg and susan um this episode here number 37 with ian stepler uh best mite treatments question mark uh, is going to be available on the nature's image farm podcast and also, the, this replay is going to be posted to our YouTube channel. There's going to be a lot of information to take away from tonight's conversation. Um, and I think how we all apply that, we're going to start. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens um, coming up. We had nearly 300 folks on tonight. So I want to thank everybody uh, for the comments, uh, for joining, for sp- spending this kind of time with us. What that says about the community is that we're all looking to do better. We're all trying to find ways to continue to tune up um, our programs and do what's right by the bees. And so I want to thank everybody for not only their efforts in doing that, um, but for, um, for all of your support. Uh, it, it really does mean a lot. Got to thank our buddy Brian at Castle Hives uh, for um, the super chat. Bruce, for your super chat. And uh, we had another one uh, that came through earlier today. Um, I think it was Matt Kirkland. Matt, Matt Kirkland. Kirkland. That's it. Yeah, Matt Kirkland. Uh, thanks a lot for that, too. I really do appreciate you guys. Um, so that's, that's what's going on. So, so stay tuned to the Bruce's Bees YouTube channel, the Castle Hives YouTube channel, the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel. And um, if you, uh, we're going to talk about spring prep, especially in the bee yard um, this mm-hmm. Sunday night at 8 p.m. And uh, we're going to get into it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you are looking for packages, nukes, or queens, um, you can visit us at naturesimagefarm.com. Uh, we still have some queen availability uh, for June. Um, we have packages for sale, three-pound packages, and also we've got our five-frame nukes. 
Uh, so uh, don't wait too long. Get in there while you can. Um, we also are going to have uh, the Premier Pura boxes um, unassembled. We're going to have them wax dipped. If you want them painted and assembled, we can ship out skids. And if you're looking for uh, Premier Foundation assembled frames with the foundation in it, um, we can help you out there too. There's a lot of things you're going to see um, on our website, including the brand spanking new Instant Vape that has the uh, voltage regulation in it, the battery protection right in the unit, available on our website too. Um, so anyways, uh, you can see that and more at naturesimagefarm.com. I appreciate all you guys. And um, it, you guys really make this whole thing um, special. It's not a single one of us just want to get on here and just um, talk for the sake of it. But when we know when we're sharing the dialogue, when we're being transparent um, with our experience and that we're all working together to do better, I think that that really makes um, a big deal. So I want to thank you guys again for watching. Thanks to uh, Tim Byrne Jr. Uh, for donating um, that hive. And of course, our friend Ian Stepler for spending the evening with us uh, talking about strategy and uh, mite treatment. So until the next time, as always, remember to be the lighthouse and be the change you want to see in this world. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.